Can you monitor greenhouse emissions from space? That's what I want to know. The short answer is yes. That's my next guest day job. With six satellites traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, they are helping industries and anyone else find and monitor methane leaks around the world. Jean-Francois Gauthier, Director of Strategic Initiatives and Measurements for GHG Sat, has a sweet job. It's pretty impressive technology. It sounds like it's like in a scene out of a sci-fi movie, but it's real. And the implications and opportunities for things like future carbon markets, uh, international compliance, enforcement is massive there's a bright future for this canadian company that's for sure this is through the noise podcast i'm your host ernesto blackspin all right jean francois thank you for uh giving me some of your time i know you're super busy um monitoring the world from space right <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, you know, the this, I can't remember exactly what article I had come across, but I was just um, surprised by a few things about the technology. Um, but before, maybe before I go, what was surprised me about it? Why don't we, why don't you give me like, what do you say when you sit down and this like at a dinner party? And someone would just ask you, what do you do? How do you describe your role? Well, uh, it's always kind of an interesting journey to try to explain what we do because <laughs> it's so different and so novel, right? So uh, we monitor greenhouse gas emissions from space. When I say greenhouse gas emissions, I, I mean methane, uh, methane emissions specifically. So methane is the, the main, the primary component of natural gas but it is also emitted uh, from a variety of other sources like landfills, like agriculture, like coal mines. So we look at all of these sources with our satellites. And uh, what makes us different from anyone in the world right now actually is the fact that we zero in directly on industrial facilities. So we measure emissions directly from industrial sites because our satellites uh, operate at a, uh, a spatial resolution. So a a pixel size that uh, that allows us to to really pinpoint where the emissions are coming from. So so we measure those at 25 meter resolution uh, up until we launched in 2016. Satellites had been looking at uh, at uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the past, but they were always looking at them at a regional scale, at a global scale to inform climate models. So, uh, so we saw an opportunity there to, to complement uh, what's being done at the global level and really go down to the facility level. So at, at 25 meters, you could really help, like I would imagine some kind of like oil refinery process, some kind of get, you know, gas refinery mm -hmm. process where there's a lot of pipes going in and out for miles or something with that. Would yeah, that that, that's correct. I mean, the, the interesting thing, the, the, the uh, you know, the paradox there is that, you know, for most people, 25 meters, would, they would think, oh, that's actually not not that great because the mm -hmm. current standard for uh, for satellite imagery is around 30 centimeters for visual imagery. Sure. But sure. when you're looking picture, at gas, right. exactly. So when you're looking at gas emissions and you're trying to pinpoint uh, which facility it's coming from, 25 meters is more than sufficient. We can zero in on a, a well pad, for example, in a region like uh, like the Permian Basin in Texas, where you know, in a twelve by twelve kilometer image uh, that that we acquire with the satellite, there could be hundreds of possible uh, sources of emission, possible uh, well pads, compressor stations, uh, gas treatment plants, all sorts of uh, of uh, uh, pipelines as well. Um, so, uh, so all of these could be potential sources. So we can monitor all of these at the same time in an image and differentiate between them as long as uh, they are separated by usually a few pixels. So let's say fifty meters. Hmm. I mean, a fifty, like a twenty-five meter square meter thing is like the size of a building, right? How would you? What's a good way of 
giving a visual analogy there? Uh, a, a visual would be, uh, you know, a, a few cars. Like you, you, you look at uh, at the size of like the length of a car is is about you know uh, about three three meters, three four meters. So so you'd be looking at let's say uh, maybe a, a school bus is is a good uh, a good uh, uh, estimate of of you know what what we're looking at in terms of of size. Uh, but for us, it's more than sufficient to say emissions are coming from this well pad. Now we can't tell you, you know, it's coming directly from this valve or directly from uh, from this flange that's leaking. That's not that's not what uh, it's meant to do. But it does make it much easier for operators to zero in on that facility mm. instead of the hundreds of others that are in the area. Uh, and then they can go down with other instruments to really pinpoint where where that leak is is taking place and then fixing it. I, I you know, the per Permian Basin, I'm just slowly learning more about it. But there was a study you guys have put out. It was in two, uh, 2021. And I think you guys just generally just took a, a vi big visual view of the area and something like to the tune of 500 kilograms or about a thousand pounds of emissions were per hour were being leaked in that giant area that you were looking at this huge space. That's like, and I think the Permian Basin is like one of America's most important gas uh, extraction areas, right? Mm -hmm. So I presume if there's several companies, many perhaps, many installations, if you're able to sort of have this down to a 25 meter square meter view, you can tell like, okay, it's this company's operations, not the guys down. Like it's the, it's the new, the, the unusual one. There was, there was like in, in the abstract, it described that it seemed like there were more leaks coming out of newer installations, which feels a little counterintuitive to me. Why would a newer installation be more leaky than some of the stuff that's been there a while? Yeah, it's, uh, on that one? So it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting region uh, of, of the U.S. and of the world because of the density of operation, you know, the 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 shale uh, oil and gas boom that that happened in the last couple of decades uh, has really brought uh, a tremendous amount of activity in that region. So I, I don't uh, I, we, we put out numbers all the time, so I don't know exactly which one you're referring to, but like okay. 500 kilograms per hour is actually the size of a uh you know a pretty average emission we like a single emission we might see in that in that area really single wow. well wow so uh so we see uh we see dozens of these a week uh over the region as we monitor uh we distribute our capacity over the the whole area and uh and you're absolutely right i mean we're able to pinpoint which uh, which company is operating uh, these facilities, so we can communicate with them and let them know, hey, you know, your facility is uh, uh, seems to be having a leak. Uh, you might want to go check it out. So uh, so, and that resolution that we talk about allows us to really differentiate between the possible uh, the possible. Uh, operators that might be responsible because, and that's really important because in that region, in a single picture that I mentioned earlier, 12 by 12 kilometers, not only would there be hundreds of facilities, but there could be dozens and dozens of operators because mm. of the way the leases are distributed and they could be uh, adjacent, like right next to one another. So the ability to pinpoint which one uh, it, it, it is. And narrow is, down, uh, right. Important. That's got to be huge. And by the way, for the operators, um, I would presume it's like it's product that's leaking to them, right? Like it, if they, you know, we have to use some of these things that you just don't want in the air, but for other production processes, for other manufacturing, these are products they need. So, I mean, I would, I guess, I guess where I'm getting at is what has, how have some of these folks received, you know, the, the information from you guys i mean does it feel to them like oh no somebody's monitoring us from space now or is it more like oh great thanks for telling us that we're because we, we're under regulatory pressure to do something about it and we couldn't we haven't been able to identify which of all these facilities or plants is the one that's causing us the, uh, the headaches there are a lot of moving parts to this so you're you're absolutely right that you know this is this is a actually a valuable product for them this is something that they can generate revenue from but also it can be a byproduct of their operations so when you're drilling for oil specifically 
you uh, almost inevitably, especially in that region of the world, you get some gas uh, coming up as well. So, uh, so how do you deal with that gas? You know, do you put it into the value chain, try to sell it? Do you flare it, uh, or uh, you know, does it accidentally vent, for example, uh, which is you know the, some of the instances that we might be able to see? So, uh, and uh, and there might be uh, many reasons why a newer facility or a facility that's actually being uh, being built might be leaking. So when they're drilling and they're actually setting up, like moving the rig off of the site. Uh, and and doing various activities there those are times where where emissions might be higher so there's there's uh it's a very dynamic region there's a lot of movement a lot of activity constantly uh a lot of uh operations that take place like liquids unloading and uh and these kinds of things that uh you know emissions might happen at that point and the key to remember is that a lot of these emissions are intermittent so uh mm -hmm. so then the ability to look at them frequently or revisit an area frequently really starts providing you with valuable insight on the nature of those emissions because some of them might be one off like it might be a scheduled venting that has exactly. to happen you just to keep the venting right. exactly for a uh for a a maintenance event for example or but others might be a malfunction it might be something that is not working properly and now you start seeing it over and over again so the ability to revisit becomes crucial okay so um but let's talk about the actual satellites because you guys have now six of them flying around can you give me just a sense of like how are they positioned how are you able to revisit the same field presumably they're up in space they're flying at however many <laughs> To stay in orbit, what seventeen thousand miles per hour, whatever it is, to, to get past the curvature of the Earth, like how? Do, what's the what's the scope of that space, and how does that how does that play out into the scheduling if so, you get a new <clears throat> system? Yeah, so our satellites are in what we call a uh, a, a polar sun synchronous orbit. So uh, first of all, polar means that the satellites orbit from north to south. Uh, as the as the Earth rotates uh, underneath it, and then sun synchronous means that uh, they come back to the same spot uh, on Earth at uh, approximately the same time every day. And why is that important? Well, it gives us uh, a chance of having uh, similar lighting conditions when we come to the same spot. Now, of course, with the seasons, the sun angle will change a little bit, but overall, by coming back at the same time of the day. Uh -oh. You uh, you get the the most uh, illumination possible because that's what we use. We use sunlight. We measure the absorption of uh, of sunlight by the gas of interest in this case methane, and then we convert that measure of absorption to a concentration. So depending on how much light gets absorbed, we can convert that to concentration of the gas in the atmosphere. So these satellites constantly orbit north to south they uh they uh orbit the earth about 14 times a day each uh and what it means is that basically each satellite can come back to the same spot on earth so come back to the same site about every two weeks so that's the reason why we have six today why we have ambitions of continuously adding more right now to our constellation so we can revisit sites more frequently for the reason I highlighted earlier, for example, in terms of characterizing if emissions are intermittent or not, but also to look at more sites as well. So it gives us more and more coverage because these satellites are not all in, in line. They're in different planes, so they're all orbiting at different times. So it gives us more opportunity. The other reason why it's important is because clouds are not our friends. Um, you know, if we're relying right. on sunlight, you can imagine that if it's cloudy, it can cause it can it can cause issues for our measurements. So, if we miss a an opportunity because of clouds, then uh, then the next day or a couple of days after, we can have another satellite fly over and get another opportunity. So, uh, having a larger constellation allows us to uh, to mitigate the risk of of weather uh, as well in uh, in our operations. But I presume to do that, you need you need to onboard more customers because some of that that 
gets then refiltered into the investment of creating the satellite, of building the satellite, getting it launched, going through all that process. What's that? What's that like? What? How? Uh, like, it, does it take a year from start to finish when you're sort of scheduling something, or do you have to find some rocket you can get it on, <laughs> and negotiate <laughs> the trip uh, up? So it's it's a long process to build and launch a satellite. Like it's not something you do in a couple of months. So we constantly look at uh, at uh, at the demand for our services, how okay. customers are are taking up the 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 service. It's a subscription based service. So uh, so customers work with us. They give us the sites that they want to measure. They just give us the coordinates. Then we enter that in our system and we start monitoring these sites on a regular basis. So, uh, so as we see the demand growing, and as also we see the uh, the needs of our customers evolving, because when we started, you know, uh, measuring sites once a month was was yeah, it was groundbreaking because for many of them, measuring once a year or a few times a year was was already. Uh, a challenge because of the cost associated with sending people on the ground, the methods that were being used. So now by shifting the paradigm, making it more accessible, now it opens up the possibility to not just go monthly, but go weekly, and then eventually go daily to revisit sites. So so as we see that demand growing, now we're looking at scaling the constellation. uh, uh, And we look at that on a continuous basis uh, for the years to come. So for example, right now we have six additional satellites already in construction uh, for launch uh, next year. So uh, so we're uh, you know we're constantly looking at sizing uh, sizing the constellation to meet the needs of our customers. Is that so this that's gonna double your your fleet, right? That's Within correct. the year? Within that's the correct. Year. So you can you can see the rate of uh, that we're really accelerating now because yeah. this, year, this year we just doubled uh, in May when we launched uh, our uh, our most recent three satellites, and now we're we're you know starting to increase the cadence and uh, and looking at more uh, almost doubling again next year. So uh, so yeah, I mean it is uh, it, it is uh, um, again a reflection of the uh, interest across all the industries that we service uh, to to get some valuable data to help manage emissions. Now on the emission measurement side, I figure you know a few things about that. Um, where do you, like, how do you calibrate the amount that's released with the ability of the refraction you're getting from the sunlight into the camera's lens? Like, how does that, how did that happen? over time, especially since well, you were probably one of the first, right, to do this? Well, uh, I mean, our, our science team spent uh, a tremendous amount of time designing the instrument, uh, doing running, running some tests uh, in, in a lab environment to make sure that we could correlate the measure of the absorption to some level of concentration. Uh, and then, you know, the, the real litmus test is when we are now in space and now we're able to do some uh, some more detailed testing of the instrument to really validate what the performance uh, uh, is. So, for example, we perform a test called controlled releases, where uh, gas is released on the ground, and at the same time, uh, we measure and then we compare because that the, the amount that's released is measured very very accurately, and then uh... we can compare that with what we measure, and then we see. Uh, in the, uh, and we perform these tests in a variety of conditions. So then we can see how the instrument performs with a true release on the ground. And we perform these tests ourselves, but we also perform them with partners, uh, academic partners. A lot of these tests are blind, so we don't know necessarily where the release might be exactly or mm. uh, or the magnitude. How much? Yeah, exactly. But and then, they will share that afterwards after you correct. sort of do your analysis. And we think it was this much. And they're like, great. It was pretty close within some variance range. Exactly. Right? Wow. Exactly. Actually, wow. we worked with a team at Stanford University that ran a, a project uh, last fall. And they actually just have a paper right now in preprint uh, showing the the performance of, of our satellites, but also other satellite systems that are in orbit right now, most of them are public satellites from the European Space Agency, for example, 
not necessarily designed to look at point sources, but they have some ability to do so. So, so the the performance of all these systems is is compared uh, based on these types of tests. Got it. So that's that's where your sort of feedback loop exists with the technology, and then I presume wind conditions at the time of the release has a factor, right? Because like if it's really windy, it disperses the molecules further away. Like do you account for that. You yeah, you you've done your research because uh, because yes, I mean wind is is a major factor, not just for satellites, for every method uh, of uh, of monitoring and measuring emissions. Because now you're dealing with complex fluid mechanics of how uh, how the uh, the the plume of methane might mix with the with the air, uh, how quickly it dissipates. So, uh, so when we actually, we measure concentration with our satellites, but then we need to perform additional operations to go from concentration to rate of emission. So we go from, uh, let's say parts per billion to uh, a kilogram per hour uh, figure. So that, uh, that calculation, that operation relies heavily on wind direction and wind speed because we know the shape of the plume, we know the concentration distribution within that plume. And now if we look at the wind and how it might have transported the gas downwind, we can backtrack to the source and figure out what the rate uh, of emission was. Was from uh, that. Right. So there are cases, however, where if the wind is too high, we might not be able to detect. Or actually what the wind will do is if the wind increases in speed, our detection threshold tends to go up a little bit because if the emissions are a bit lower, then our nominal detection threshold won't catch it for the mm -hmm. same reason we just discussed, because it will it will dissipate faster. So wind plays a very important role in this. And again, and it highlights the need to come back, uh, come back more often, because if you try to measure on right. one day and the wind is, is quite high, the next day or in two days, the conditions might be different. So you might get a different view on the emissions of that particular site. I presume then, you, especially if you get it to that level where you can come back within a couple of days, you can then calculate the rate of emissions even easier because you're sort of taking the snapshot in perhaps slightly different wind conditions at that point. And you can just move faster with your reporting. Well, thing. it allows you to to be able to tell if the if the the rate first of all are the emissions constant, like are they continuous mm -hmm. uh, uh, continuously taking place, but also is the rate changing because now it becomes wind adjusted. Like once we start making that calculation, and then uh, and then we do we uh, do we see the the rate changing drastically over time, or uh, or is it fairly consistent? Uh, and that might be an indication of the the type of leak, the type of malfunction that might be taking place as well. Wow. Can you just shifting gears a little bit? Can you give me like how did you how'd you get into this line of work? Like let's go back to the dinner conversation. Like how did you <laughs> find yourself doing this? You know? Well, um, so space and aerospace have always been uh, my my number one passion. Uh, you can probably see that in, in yep. that, you know, around me there. <laughs> you know, like you know, like satellite models and and pictures of the shuttle, and it's been a huge part of my life since I was a kid. I've always wanted to work in this field. So, uh, so I uh, for the longest time I worked uh, in the uh, the telecommunication area of space working okay. on very large satellites that, for example, will provide satellite television uh, or communication uh, for, uh, you know, cell phone backhaul, those kinds of things. So uh, so when uh, after 15 years working in, in that in that uh, arena, uh, the opportunity came up to uh, to join JSG Sat. I mean, JSG Sat uh uh was uh, was known to me you know the canadian uh space community is a is a tight-knit community so I, I i knew of our founder stefan and and uh, the lofty um sort of objectives that he had with uh, with jay shisa and the actual um mission of the company you know and, and to to use space to uh to for the betterment of mankind for the betterment of the planet really resonated with me that is something that my mm. previous company like it was really part of uh, of the ethos uh from from founding all the way to close to when i left i mean the company had been acquired 
by a U.S. entity. Uh, that whole uh, mission was a bit lost in the shuffle, <clears throat> and it was uh, it was amazing to be able to find it again. Uh, you know, this idea to use space uh, to really, uh, for the betterment of mankind, uh, was very important to me. And uh, and then fast forward now, like six years in, in October that I've been with Jay Shisa. And uh, and we're doing amazing things uh, to to really help address this this challenge that's ahead of us. Let me ask you this, and I know you're not the you're not necessarily tied to the business develop business side of the the biz, but I am curious to know of the opportunity. Right, aside, it's not just that you're doing something that the world really needs at at the time right now, but it's also just the potential market size for the services you guys have. Can you give us some sense of who could be target customers? I don't mean I don't even, I don't even like saying the word target. It seems it's always like you're you're zeroing. But who would be the sort of the ideal customer base that have become customers? And what's the sort of size of potential for the for the future of this company? Well, um, so this will be cliche because we're, you know, a space company with a sky or space is literally the limit here because what we do uh, is not only important to industry, but it's also useful for governments. It's useful for regulators. It's useful for the financial markets uh, in terms of looking at responsible investing, uh, those kinds of things. So, so there are... Uh, there are almost limitless applications for the type of data that we generate. I mean, there's there's applications that that uh, we we haven't even thought of yet that I'm sure will continue emerging because that's the way it's been the last six years. I mean, I I, I just men mentioned the financial uh, industry, and uh, you know, even three years ago, this whole concept of uh, of ESG, environmental and social governance, was. Uh, it existed, but it was marginal and nobody really talked about it. And since then, it's really taken off. And this is exactly uh, the sort of activity that requires real data to make decisions, make informed decisions mm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and help uh, sort of uh, manage uh, things properly. So, uh, so you know, th there will be others that will emerge like that. But the one thing to, you know, if I take a half step back, uh, we've decided very early on uh, that uh, Jay Shisai was going to be uh, a neutral uh, provider of data to anyone who wants to access it. So, uh, so we supply to anyone who's interested uh, in uh, in uh, licensing our data. So that that's industry, of course. It could be government regulators. It could be NGOs. So, uh, so we do not exclude anyone uh, from from that because. Ultimately, the goal for us is to have the greatest possible impact for the planet. And that's something our team, our employees are all uh, exceedingly passionate about. Like this is really what uh, what draws people in to work uh, for us and gets them to stay with them because they know that what we're doing, what we're doing really matters and they can feel that uh, that we're making a difference. So uh, so the market for this continues expanding. And, uh, you know, you can also even uh, make a case for carbon markets. You know, they th that was actually the original motivation for GHG SAP. Our founder was uh, was inspired by the uh, the uh, the setting up of a carbon market between California and Quebec, the province of Quebec and Canada uh -huh. back then. And uh, and realized that, you know, if there's going to be uh carbon being traded uh, uh, over these instruments, then uh, it would need to be measured accurately. Otherwise, you don't really know what you're trading. So that was kind of the, the light bulb going on. And, uh, and you know, this is still very much uh, something that, like, that, you know, for which it could be used. And you look at the Paris Agreement as well, for example, and being able to measure the uh, not only the contribution of each country, but the progress that they're making in reducing their emissions, and then having a uh, the possibility to do this with the same instrument across the world, you're looking at everything through the same lens. So now you know there's no argument about how did you measure this, you know, uh, performing some equivalencies, those kinds of things. 
So, yeah. so the, uh, it, it's really, uh, the appeal is really broad. Wow. This, this, I mean, that is, if there was criticism, I mean, there's ESG is such a huge topic and you realize it's one of the, one of the main challenges is like, how do you put policies and governance and, and, you know, evaluate fairly across industries or just across companies within an industry when it's, when at the time this stuff started, we didn't really have actual data collecting sources that were like non-biased, right? Like it's just, you guys are in the middle. You're just, you're just put the camera on and do the analysis. And then that's where the emissions are coming from. And that's how much exists there. Right. So once you start to quantify it, you know, um, that, that can be a real big game changer. So for example, when I started this show, we, you know, I just was interested in trade associations in particular, but all types of nonprofits, but trade associations were interesting to me because it, it's the way an industry where comp competitors within an industry come together to get a group of people to represent their interests, special, okay, special interest groups. But I'm thinking of a group like the National Gas Association, which is a huge group. They're very, they have resources. They're, re, they're divided. The natural gas region is really collaborative because none of them directly compete with each. The members don't directly compete with each other. They, they have their region that they cover, and then that's the region, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in the interest of regulation, if regulation starts to come down, and, it, and they are heavily regulated, but more likely than not, the future means more regulation against them, not less. And so one of the strategies the associations do is try to get ahead of that before the government regulators. Government regulators come in, they don't have all the resources to always enforce uniformly, but they can say, well, we might we we might put regulations here and you might not like them, might not be as favorable unless you guys figure out how to self-regulate. OK, well, how do you self-regulate? You have to find the baseline. What's the baseline emissions that are you know, schedule the missions, schedule just part of the, you know, course of due business and what are actual irresponsible leaks just, or just not enough resources to cover however many miles of this piping that exists to get gas from one place to the other, right? Something like your service could be invaluable to that trade association because they could probably purchase licensing or access, right? To do across the country, yeah, I, and do I'll, the analysis. I'll, I'll take it a step further. Uh, you know, when you look at regulations and and how they obviously impact uh, industry and and these uh, these associations represent their members, their 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 objective is to look after the best interest of uh, uh, of the industry and those companies. And you know, it's not usually it's not that the industry is against doing the right thing environmentally. But when you look at some regulations and how they, what they might impose on companies, it might be uh, exceedingly onerous and unrealistic. So you look at the new EPA rules that are being discussed and are still under review right now, uh, and they were looking at at monitoring uh, monitoring facilities uh, every uh, every two months, so six times a year. Uh, so. There's a big difference in cost to an operator if you're going to deploy people on the ground by foot six times a year at thousands of sites that are scattered mm. across the land, which is you know very time consuming, very costly. What do they do? What are they monitoring with? Like they what is it like some kind of inf some kind of infrared thing? Some kind of like what is that process like? Yeah, so that and, you know the current they're actually current regulations right now only permit uh, the use of uh, of uh, optical gas imaging cameras OGI cameras. So okay. uh, so that's uh, you know that's that's kind of the the, the limiting factor there. And you know, a guy in a truck with a specialized camera going down the line basically, or oh. basically driving from well pad to well pad getting out looking at the at the site and then you get you know you get a a, a reading at that particular site and then you have to drive to the next one and but but you know if the uh if the regulations allow for new technologies that are emerging because satellites are a big part of this but there's there's many many others like drones and mm -hmm. aircraft technologies and even in situ monitors like the the uh the advances in in methane monitoring the last decade or so have really been amazing but what these trade associations like the role that they can play is advocate for this and say listen we've actually worked with these other methods 
they can accomplish the same thing at a much lesser cost for us. And actually, we can even monitor more frequently at a lesser cost and, and, uh, and have even more data. But the regulations have to have the mechanisms built in to allow for these new technologies to be considered. So only now is this starting to be part of the thought process. The EPA mm -hmm. was clearly thinking about it in their current process. But having not only, not necessarily dictating, you know, thou shall use satellites or drones or, but just allow operators to uh, make the case at least for new, for new uh, technologies to be used because they are, uh, they are effective uh, and they are uh, also, they're, they're, they're just, they're efficient and they're cost effective. And, and eventually uh, they, they provide better and more data than, uh, than alternative, more costly methods. So I, I presume the future would probably be get the satellite imagery from a company like yours. And then when you do see an anomaly from the, the general threshold, then send the guy out there with the camera to get exactly. even like quicker, more accurate. So you're not wasting time driving up and down stuff. You got it. Uh, you know what the, this concept of a, uh, a tiered monitoring system, this is mm -hmm. not something that, you know, it's not a GHG sat uh, invention. It's been around for a while. Operators, recognize that this is a really effective way of doing things and some regulators are as well uh, but this this idea that you look at sites very very frequently with satellites because it's easy uh you know the there's no uh there's no need to send personnel on the ground everything is done remotely and uh, for those reasons also the cost is uh is a lot less so it's more affordable to look at things more frequently now the drawback is that you can only look at emissions of a certain level. You can't mm -hmm. go down to the smaller ones. So then you can deploy, the second tier would be to deploy another technology like an aircraft, for example. But now you can afford to, instead of trying to deploy that aircraft- Oh, monthly, across all over the yeah. thing where you didn't really need to cover right. that, you can actually do it at this one spot and- At, at this one spot, or you can deploy it everywhere, but to do it one, twice a year or quarterly instead right. of trying to do it monthly. Because you're looking for the, you already identify potential problem spots instead of just full on scanning. You would That's use right. And you also identify the biggest, yeah. uh, the biggest culprits, the biggest emitters. So you're, you're confident that you've addressed the biggest leaks and now you can afford to- address the smaller ones, perhaps less urgently. So you keep wow. going and eventually you send people on the ground to clean up the tiny flange leaks and the tiny, so it may, but you can afford to do that once a year instead of trying to do it, mm. you know, four or five or six times a year. Sounds to me that that's what the National Gas Association would be really in interested in. <laughs> getting a look at something like this, because then they, you know, the, the government tries to offload its enforcement as much as it can, right? Like if there's a, there's a trade group and they have a certifying body and they're monitoring, they have a monitoring tool and they know who all the players are in the, in the, their members, right? They can then notify their members much quicker. Hey, we just saw something that might be an anomaly or might or be might something be some different, but you, you need to go check that out. And that can right. be relied on then, then you have a, a self-monitoring system. And oh, by the way, this information could also be made public for others, right? I would presume. Um, it depends on the deal. Is it like per deal? I mean, it's a subscription-based model, but would you entertain other arrangements, other partnerships um, with... Well, uh, we always look at, at various different ways of making our data uh, uh, available and, and affecting a change. So, for example, we uh, through a uh, uh, a uh, through through support from the government of Canada, we are uh, contributing data to the International Methane Emissions Observatory, the IMEO. Uh, it's a UNEP uh, initiative to. Uh, to help countries address their emissions and uh, and look at super emitters, for example. So we're contributing data to that. So it's a completely different model from what we normally do. This is more like aggregated data over regions and and uh, uh, but but it's still uh, it still works towards the same goal of uh, of uh, affecting change and reducing emissions down the line. So since you're since. It's some of your satellites are pole to pole, right? You basically cover the 
you if, uh, with time you can co- you cover the whole earth so if there's a region or a country or a specific state or whatever in that suddenly wants to tighten up the regulations and they want to monitor more that would potentially become a customer but how do you market to those like as a small business or this sort of starting business you guys are how do you market your services into that space other than coming on a show like this but like how do you (laughs) do you keep an eye on potential regulation that's like coming down the pike for different regions of of the world like how does that happen? Yeah, we we obviously we keep an eye on on the evolution of regulations around the world. And for example, uh, you know, methane regulations in Canada are very are very advanced compared to other parts of the world. The U.S. is also quite uh, obviously advanced, but other parts of the world there's there's either no regulations or they are only starting to consider it. So we uh we obviously talk to uh to uh, to the governments themselves to the regulators to discuss how we can help them but we also talk to operators in those jurisdictions to say you know listen you know there might not be any any regulations now but uh they will be coming down the road so it's better to be ready now understanding your emissions and addressing them today and also regulations can be one motivator for uh, industry to work with us or or with other you know companies uh that measure methane emissions but there are other reasons you touched on one earlier about uh you know protecting uh preventing loss of revenue for example so keeping the molecules in the value chain and also this whole concept that uh your investors and shareholders are looking and they're now demanding action in in an annual report they want to see progress it's not it's not sufficient anymore to put a a statement a one-liner in an annual report that says we care about emissions now uh you know the the investors the shareholders and to a large extent the general public are much smarter on these issues and they're demanding to see progress measurable progress so um so there's there's many levers uh, that that can be uh, motivators for industries to to do this and 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 be proactive and not wait for regulations to necessarily uh, you know come be, be put in place uh, before acting. And I, I think this is also a possible tool um, available to kind of counter some of the cynicism around some of the greenwashing of of value chain issues, right? That that oh, we bought some carbon offsets somewhere, uh, but no one really digs too deep as to where that's coming from. If that's truly happening, I mean, there's I just think that there's opportunities there that probably you have. I don't know who knows if you've come across them or not, but I would assume that. There's spots there that can help validate that yes, this company is taking extra, ex, you know, ex, you know, a, a, additional steps that their their competitors have not. So you might p- pay a little more for whatever their services are, but you're 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 reassured because it's like here we use this modern service. You can see the data. You can you can look at our, our reduction in emissions and our stuff, right? Yeah, um, you're 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 absolutely right. However, like for us, you know, we uh, like I said earlier, we we see ourselves as a uh, like a transparent, independent provider of data, and that data doesn't lie. It can be used for a variety of things. Uh, and this whole concept that you just mentioned is an interesting one, where uh, you know uh, there's an, an increasing uh, there's increasing evidence now that the the consumers will be willing to pay more for a uh, a product that's been responsibly sourced so the idea of responsibly sourced gas where you know the by which the providers that feed the gas down to a you know a, a residential distribution system can certify that they uh, were uh, taking all the steps to control the emissions, uh, you know, upstream before before the the even before the the gas started making its way uh, down the value chain. So uh, so that's that's very important. But also, of course, the integrity of the data and how this is examined becomes crucial because uh, once the, those consumers lose faith in uh in how all of this is kind of guaranteed or certified then you're likely not to, you're not likely to get them back so 
uh, so because you know there's certain cynicism that installs uh, right health. and so uh but it is an important what you what you brought up there is an important concept and it is something that's really emerging now today uh in terms of uh in terms of uh mot another motivator for for companies and, and operators to to take certain steps in order to uh, to take part in uh, on that side of the uh of the uh of the equation it's like the it's like the the reputational risk is greater but also the potential profitability could be greater for different industries uh if they get this right and if, if they get it wrong then that's that's when uh, things could be really damaging, right? So, and I think that's probably the resistance if there has been historically resistance over the years. It's just like, we don't have the tools. We don't, we're not sure who, how we're measuring this. They're, the markets just hasn't, hasn't developed. But you guys have been in it in this past six years. What's, what's been surprising? What's been different from when you guys started to where you are today? Uh, a lot has changed. Uh, I can tell you, uh, you know, six years ago when I started traveling the world, I'll always remember one of the first conferences I went to uh, in Japan, a large uh, oil and gas conference called Gas Tech. And, uh, uh, and when I was uh, going from operator to operator to explain what, what we were offering with our first satellite, um, I was getting a lot of very puzzled looks uh you know like you're doing what with <laughs> satellites uh are you spying on us uh, you know, uh, and others were just kind of uh, basically almost laughing uh others were more concerned and so that you know like the uh the, the response was uh was uh, all over the map but there were many that were also uh responding there in, in with much curiosity and seeing the potential right away and a lot of these uh a lot of these became uh longtime customers and partners of ours you know because they they were uh essentially early adopters of new technologies and and stuck with us and you know like the performance of our system has vastly improved since that since that first satellite in 2017 uh many of those are are still with us today they're still customers today and we've we've grown the work we do with them year over year so uh so you know the the way the market the way industry has perceived what we offer has changed dramatically over the last mm. uh six years i mean we we kind of in a way we, we we pioneered a brand new segment in terms of uh measuring methane emissions that had never really been done before to look at industrial facilities, like individual facilities with satellites. So, uh, so there was an education period, but if I take, uh, if I take a step back and I look at the industry, the oil and gas industry as a whole, for example, uh, the whole idea, <clears throat> the whole, the way methane emissions and the, the challenge that it represents the way that's perceived, that's evolved, uh, tremendously over the last five years. You know, before uh, five years ago, six years ago, there was still a lot of reluctance to even, you know, look at this as an issue. You know, there was more of a, you know, uh, what I don't know can't hurt me kind mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, and now uh, there's, you know, especially with last year with COP26, with the global methane pledge, where they, there's a lot of traction around methane, around how it is a low hanging fruit how by addressing this now this this actually provides the best chance for an impact uh like a quick impact because it's a a gas that has a really uh you know 80 84 to 86 times more damaging than carbon dioxide but also have a, a much shorter lifespan in the atmosphere so if you address it today you see the benefits much quicker oh, right it burns up it, it this whatever it happens to that molecule right gets yeah, exactly. So, so the industry, uh, governments uh, have all now come to this. Uh, I mean, it, it's not like they didn't necessarily understand it, but there's been a collective epiphany of sorts now where, where like it's you know, people like to call it the methane moment. Like it's, it's really uh, an opportunity now. It's seen an, as an opportunity to, to, to have an impact rather than this kind of nuisance, like, don't talk to me about this because right now it's not causing me any problems. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, there's been other factors that played a role into this, the rise of ESG, the rise of this sure. shareholder and investor awareness that I mentioned. So all of these things kind of, uh, applying pressure in one direction yeah. together. So, yeah. So I take it now your prospect prospective customers are like, well, actually tell me more. <laughs> what else, what can your system right. do? Right. Conversations. Yeah. Can, can you walk exactly. us through, um, a little bit on the, like, what's the onboarding like, and give me, give me like a sense. Cause I know it sounds like this could be still pretty bespoke arrangements, but like how, it, it's subscription based. What's sort of the entry level and what would I expect as an onboarding process with you guys? It's, it's surprisingly simple. So, uh, you know, one of the, uh, one of the challenges with uh, satellite technologies for, especially for earth observation has been uh, that it's been perceived and, and for a lot, like a, a lot of times, rightfully so as, as being kind of a weird, black box you know (laughs) exotic can't really don't really know what to do with this don't really how do i even order this imagery how so uh so we've taken the mystery and the challenge largely out of it it's actually quite a simple process so customers tell us the coordinates of the sites they want to measure uh and uh and the frequency at which they want to look at them and then we we start monitoring and then we provide data on a regular basis and if we see an emission we provide an alert we say we notice something here that that usually those alerts are typically provided under 24 hours now so we're able to say hey this particular facility looks like it has an emission here's the picture of it uh and and then you you should probably go take a look at it so uh and then we provide within those subscriptions there's different levels of uh, of data that's provided depending on uh, the depth of knowledge with this type of data that the customer might have. So, you know, some customers are very advanced in uh, uh, in uh, in GIS and in kind of uh, information, uh, you know, kind of the type of satellite information that that we might be generating. So they get. They can get the, the the raw data file and they can perform additional operations. They can manipulate it. They can combine it with other data. Most of our customers just want to see the like the picture, the JPEG of the emission. A lot of the the uh, examples that you may have seen in in some news article that we've released over the years. Basically, it's a multicolored uh, plume uh, emerging from a site that gives us the the change in concentration over the site. And and for them, that's enough in terms of visualizing what's going on and prompting them to go look at it. So, uh, but but all of this gets delivered. They have the option of using everything or only portion of it. Uh, but uh, but it's, uh, it's really quite simple. Once we start a contract within a few days, we start, we start uh, providing, providing uh-huh. data. So it's, uh, and then it comes on a continual basis. We've put in place a uh, a really user friendly portal uh, that customers can log on to. It's called Spectra, uh, and uh, it's uh, password protected for each customer. All their data goes there. They can visualize it. They can manipulate it. They can even import parts of it into their own system, or they can export parts of their system into Spectra. So it's very versatile that way. It gives a lot of options for uh ingesting the the information manipulating it interpreting it so uh we're really trying to make it as easy as possible for customers to work with us and then eventually you know use the data to fulfill uh, it engage it into their database systems how does so does the subscription cost the contract cost is it is it associated with like how many places i want to monitor is there some some initial like if I want to just to get pictures of certain sites, you know, is my price going to be different if I'm monitoring ten locations versus a hundred with you guys? Yeah, there's all there's all sorts of volume volume okay. benefits that are built into these subscriptions. Like for example, a one year subscription versus a single image. You know, like there's a big benefit from going to going to the the yearly subscription because now we're revisiting the site frequently. And uh, and the uh, you know the overall price per image goes down because we're doing it more frequently. So uh, so yeah, I mean there's there's all sorts of uh, uh, of uh, various uh, pricing instruments that come into play depending on you know how many facilities we're looking at, how 
dispersed they are are they all in the same image or are they are they uh, in various countries around the world so uh so there's uh th there's various <laughs> factors like that to take into account okay so so every deal has to be discussed in a sense at this time it's not it's not quite a a la carte like here's the uh you know, if you, you want to monitor 10 sites, that's the that's the price point you're going to get. You want to monitor 100 across different nations. You, we still have to have a conversation, which is fine. Yeah. And, yeah. and the reason why it's important to have that conversation is to make sure the customer gets the best value possible. Right. Because if we make it just, you know, click something on the website and, and order something, there's a good chance that uh, it will not be optimal because there are, there are things that could come into play like, if uh, if uh, you want to monitor, for example, 10 sites, but they're all within a 12 by 12 kilometer image, that pricing will be different than if you actually monitor 12 sites in 12 separate countries. So, mm -hmm. so we need to be able to look at this and optimize the campaign for the customer and be able to, uh, you know, be able to uh, tailor it to give them the most value possible, but also minimize the cost to them. And also, uh, you know, depending on their needs, there's various other things that we can provide as well. For example, we use data, we ingest data from public satellite systems, like for example, mm -hmm. from the European Space Agency to look at, at leaks that are much larger, but these satellites revisit more frequently. So that's data that's publicly available, but that's not really easy to work with necessarily for our customers. So we ingest that data, we process it, and then we add it as a layer in Spectra to complement the data. Nice. That we so so there's, there's various yeah. things that we can do here. So you really need to have that discussion to understand exactly what they want to do so we can tailor the campaign to really meet their needs. Yeah, otherwise, if you pre-presume uh, you know, levels, certain levels, they may not, you might lose customers that just, they need something in between things at this stage. Yeah. And, and, okay. and uh, they might be turned off by the fact that All right. you know, it's either you're over servicing it or you're or too, yeah, under servicing the feature. The Right. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Jean-Francois, man, that was an hour. It zipped by. Thank you so much for giving us insight. I think there's a, a tremendous promise. Just too bad you guys are a Canadian company. I won't hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the same thing about you being in the yeah. US. There we go. <laughs> I wish you the best of luck. We, I'd love to have you guys back on as you're launching these next satellites. We should, we should do this again. Um, if somebody wants, is interested in this, we should plug the site. Uh, ghg sat sat dot com. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, okay. that's our that's our website, and we're also we have a pretty active uh, Twitter feed. We have a, an active feed on LinkedIn as well. And then uh, you know the some of the most fun things that we get to do is launch satellites. So watch for our next launch uh, middle of next year, uh, and uh, you'll be able to see uh, you know so that that should be in the early summer, late spring, early summer if everything stays on track. So we'll usually announce this and all the links are there to, to watch the, the launch. And, uh, and, uh, and we also uh, share results on these, on these channels. So, so, uh, so make sure to check it out. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jean-Francois for coming. Uh, take care guys. If you like this type of content, let me know, just subscribe or click, you know, you know, you guys know the, the drill on YouTube. <laughs> take care, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Visit throughthenoise.us for more episodes and subscribe to our newsletter. This show is produced by Through the Noise Consulting, uniting external communications and internal IT functions to ensure data and privacy are protected while creating innovative communications platforms. Want to start your own podcast? We can help. Visit getthroughthenoise.com to learn more.